Good. Thank you for joining us for today's discussion. Just a note that there will be language interpretation available in both French and Spanish. If you look down at your Zoom uh, page, you will see an interpretation button. If you click on it, you can choose the language that you want to use. Uh, so you can do that for those of us who will be listening in French or those who will be listening in Spanish. There will be audience participation throughout the session. We want you to come and do the things uh, to make it very useful for you. Ask the questions. You can raise your Zoom hat or write in the chat. And if you have any questions or comments, we'll be very welcome. So we have a very good discussion. We hope that you will enjoy it. My name is Dr. Zipora Gaduya. I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist at the Nairobi Hospital. I'm a member of the Smile Trains Medical Advisory Board, and I serve also as the secretary on the leadership committee of Global Initiative for Children's Surgery as the secretary. Yeah, and I hope that we shall have a very good time working together. I will introduce for you the speakers for the day, and then we shall see. So uh, the first, the, not in any order, Susan Abrego is a pediatric anesthesiologist and serves as the head of anesthesia at the Benjamins Blooms Children Hospital in El Salvador. She's on the board of directors for Association of Anesthesiologists of El Salvador. And she also leads the life box oximetry and surgical safety checklist work in Central America. You're going to enjoy listening to her. Reshma Abukal is a professor of anesthesiology and critical care and pain at Tata Memorial Center in Mumbai, India. And she was part of the perioperative COVID-19 report study group, which is what we are going to be disseminating today. Uh, welcome, Reshma. We are expecting to hear a lot from you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nina Kapochichi who is uh, part of the Smile Train group. She's working as Smile Train's program manager for Francophone West Africa. She's a surgical trainee who has taken a post. She's based in Benin. She's also a Lifebox Associate Fellow and part of the perioperative COVID-19 reports, which we are feeding back today. Thank you, Nina, for agreeing to be part of this great initiative. Noti, as I call her, uh, not bag Shifaba. She's a consultant and is physiologist and intensivist at Salimugabi Central Hospital in Halare, Zimbabwe. She's a very good host. She's a very good speaker. And she's the lead for case management pillar for COVID-19 in Zimbabwe and has previously Hello, led the life of oximeter training and distribution in Zimbabwe. Welcome, Noti. <laughs> Looking forward to hearing you. Hello. If you're not speaking, kindly mute your microphone. Uh, Mubarak Mohammed is a nurse and head of anesthesia at Edna Adan University Hospital in Somaliland. He is a program manager for Samsung, an initiative funded to respond to the severe shortage of anesthesia providers in Somaliland. He has participated life box training and distribution in Somaliland. Boka Mubarak, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Nicole Starr is a real star in the real world. She's the life box senior fellow and resident in general surgery at the University of California, San Francisco. She led the research team behind the preoperative COVID-19 report. Uh, which quantified the resource and training gaps for perioperative providers during COVID-19, which we are disseminating today. So um, we are looking forward to hearing a lot from Nicole and how this study went. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Dr. Gatuya. Thank you everybody for joining us today. We're so excited to um, have this discussion and share our findings. 
Um, I just want to take a few minutes to review some of the nuts and bolts of the study and some of our findings to frame the discussion today. Um, so you see on the screen the visual abstract that we've shared that has some high level survey findings. Um, and as you know, our listeners from across the globe are well aware, we uh, can see that the COVID-19 pandemic has really had a profound impact on operative volume around the globe. In high income countries, a lot of hospitals were able to cancel or postpone cases during surges of the virus throughout the last year. But in low and middle income countries, most surgical procedures are either urgent or emergent. And so hospitals can't close their operating rooms uh, for most of the operative volume or repurpose any clinical areas for COVID care. You guys, the surgeons, uh, anesthesia providers and nurses continued to work every day in your operating rooms to provide essential surgery in low income environments. And these settings often have chronic shortages of PPE even prior to the pandemic. We suspected and heard from many of our partners that resources were even more scarce during this time. And this was leading to an unsafe work environment. Our group at Lifebox, Smile Train, Japaigo, WFSA, and others had developed a COVID-19 surgical patient checklist early in the pandemic to provide a structured tool for improving staff safety in the operating room, but we weren't sure of the ability of teams to meet items on the COVID surgical patient checklist, and that's really what prompted this investigation. So in collaboration with our partners from Lifebox, Smile Train, and Japaigo, we conducted a global survey of facilities and perioperative providers to assess the availability of materials and safety processes for preventing transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in the perioperative setting. We were able to survey 230 surgical hospitals and 539 clinicians across 63 countries. And I'll briefly review some of our results now, but the main aim of our webinar today is to contextualize these findings in real provider experiences, to hear perspectives from our colleagues in different settings, and to develop some ideas for actionable solutions to improve provider safety during this ongoing time of crisis. Regarding the material resources, uh, over half of surveyed LMIC hospitals had viral filter supply chain issues, 31% had moderate to severe shortages, and 26% had no viral filters at all for their anesthesia machines. A small but not insignificant number were lacking pulse oximeters for every OR table, and about a third were lacking pulse oximeters for recovery room beds. In terms of personal protective equipment, 42% did not have routine access to surgical masks and eye protection, which we would consider the basic essential PPE for performing any clinical duties at this time and over half experienced at least a moderate shortage of N95 respirators, with 41% of providers having purchased their own N95s. Reuse of PPE was also common. 43% of providers in LMICs had done some decontamination and reuse of PPE. 10% were reusing N95s without any reprocessing method, and 8% were using decontamination methods known to damage N95 respirators, like soaking in alcohol, bleach, or washing with soap and water. Providers in low-income countries were particularly short of training support. 63% hadn't received essential training on COVID-19 OR protocols and the proper donning and doffing of PPE, and almost three quarters stated that COVID-specific OR protocols were not routinely used to protect staff or patients from infection. Not surprisingly, a large number of providers felt unsafe at work. About a third of LMIC providers did not feel safe performing their jobs in the OR, and about two thirds of those said their biggest fear was COVID-19 infection, either of themselves or colleagues or bringing the virus home to their families or community. When we performed a regression analysis on the factors predictive of reported safety, providers that had more training in infection prevention and control used more COVID-related protocols, and had reliable access to PPE, were two to four times more likely to feel safe at work. So for those of our listeners working in settings like this, these findings are not likely to come as a shock. 
However, it's our obligation as an international response community to understand and mitigate these challenges. Every healthcare worker is precious and access to essential surgery cannot be compromised, pandemic or no. So we wanna hear from our panelists and audience members how these findings reflect your workplace or not and suggestions for responding to any evident gaps to ensure a safe environment for, for providers. So thanks so much. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Zippy to moderate our panel discussion. Thank you, Nicole, for, for your work and reports. Uh, you have all had the resources and the materials that were required uh, during uh, the surgery. Those are some of the questions that you're going to ask yourself. So we are going to talk about material resources availability. We are going to have three speakers for this session, Dr. Shifaba, Noti, Dr. Susana, and Mubarak. Each of them is going to take uh, three minutes and then we shall start uh, with, with, with their talk. They can tell us what their, what their challenges were with material resource availability. Dr. Shifamba, we can start with you. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Zippy. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone who is on this call. Um, I'm from Zimbabwe and I work at one of the biggest uh, referral centers um, uh, in the country. Um, as far as material and materials and resources are concerned, um, we have had um, at our hospital, we have had some chronic shortages of which were possibly worsened by, uh, by, the, uh, by the pandemic. Uh, things like pulse oximeters, we would have probably uh, one or two pulse oximeters within the theaters, but we might have um, fewer pulse oximeters in the recovery room, which then means patients have to wait longer um, to be recovered in theater, or they would then have to be uh, moved uh, when, they are, when they are awake or when another patient actually leaves uh, a spot where there is adequate monitoring. So those are some of the uh, chronic uh, issues that we have always had. But as far as PPE is concerned, our national average has ranged anything from 19% uh, to 70%. And um, at times what we, have offer, what we have also found is uh, the distribution of, uh, of the PPE has also tended to favor the bigger institutions, uh, particularly like our hospital, it will have much more um, uh, PPE as compared to a small rural health center. And within the hospital itself as well, you will then also find that uh, places like theater, maternity, or uh, the COVID unit or the COVID ward would have um, more PPE as compared uh, to the other um, to the other areas. Right now, um, I, I miss walking into theater, picking up my theater cap, picking up my mask, uh, proceeding to see the patients and proceeding to do my work. Now I can't even do that, and it has been difficult. Now, now we have to knock onto the matron's office, and she actually hands you the mask that she wants. Uh, the other issues that we have, we have also been lacking in are quality, um, quality masks. Like, uh, for instance, I walked in into theater, I got this mask, I looked at it and I said, this mask doesn't look right. When you looked on the box, it was actually uh, a two-ply rather than a three-ply uh, surgical uh, face mask. And some of the N95 masks that we have are just one size fits all. And because they are one size fits all, sometimes they are very... Uh, they are not. Uh, they are very ill-fitting, and those patients with, where, it's Ill, where it is ill-fitting will have to at times actually um, buy their own. And um, at the onset of the pandemic, all our PP was um, was imported, but during that uh, we then had, as a country, an opportunity arose, and now um, set, uh, universities. 
other local companies which have traditionally been uh, producing uh, safety clothing and other commodities have now also started up uh, producing, uh, producing uh, uh, PPE, uh, things like gumboots, uh, they are produced locally, plastic aprons, both the reusable and uh, the disposable one. Uh, now uh, we no longer buy uh, alcohol hand wrap uh, from, uh, that is coming in from outside. They, all our universities are making this. Uh, cotton gowns and cotton scrubs are also being made locally. And our IPC pillar works with the Standards Association of Zimbabwe um, uh, to actually look at whether this material okay. And we also have our partners, um, particularly, from the UN, uh, particularly from the UN family and some other local organizations which have also stepped in uh, to, give, um, to give PPE. And going forward, I think what we have is availing uh, funds for purchase of, these, um, of the PPE. As for the, our local industry, um, our efforts at making uh, local PPE, I think they should also continue, but at the same time, uh, continue with um, getting the IPC pillar and the Standards Association of Zimbabwe to really do a rigorous um, uh, exercise in vetting whether these uh, materials and whether these uh, PPEs are of good standard. Thank you. Thank you, Nati. That was such a wonderful summary of both the challenges and um, some of the positive circumstances that you've been facing throughout the year. Um, I think we've temporarily lost Dr. Zipora. So um, I will just take over for now uh, and I'll ask Dr. Susana Abrego to um, take the floor and comment on your environment, please. Okay, thank you. Good morning and good afternoon and good night. For everyone, thank you to be with us. And thank you, uh, thank you to Lifebox to do this uh, very, very interesting webinar. Uh, I work, I'm an anesthesiologist, a pediatric anesthesiologist, and I work in a, a pediatric hospital, the unique pediatric hospital in El Salvador, a little country, the, the most little country in uh, Central America, in, uh, in America, then uh, we, we are uh, a country with uh, a lot of works and then uh, we received the, the pandemic. Uh, then uh, uh, our experience is uh, uh, very different uh, from one to other hospital because I work in a hospital of uh, third level, uh, but we have uh, uh, more uh, little hospitals, but Every one of us has uh, similar problems. Uh, when the pandemic it comes, uh, like in the everywhere, uh, the the life stops, and we have to change a lot of things. Uh, we had uh, uh, equipment, protection equipment, PPE uh, at the at the beginning of the of the pandemic but in the big hospitals, but not in every hospitals. I'm now the president of the Association of Anesthesiologists. Then I took the work to, to call, to call to every colleagues from every hospitals to ask how are them, if they have a, 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 the correct equipment and how they, they feelings with that. And uh, the experience, uh, it was really very different. Some of them, uh, like in uh, social security, they don't have uh, the equipment. They have to work with uh, what they have with, uh, with the mask N95, uh, very poor of them. And uh, they have to, uh, to continue the attention of the patient. We can say, we can't say no. To the, to the attention of the patient. At the beginning, 
at the beginning, uh, most of our hospitals received patients with COVID. We have to operate them. We have to intubate them at the ICU units because uh, uh, we are the most uh, experienced people. We, have, uh, a, we are uh, only 170 anesthesiologists, medical anesthesiologists, but we have a technician too. And we need a lot of people to attend the, the people, the, the patient with COVID. Then we have uh, problems with the PPE because uh, we receive them in the most of the little hospitals at uh, two or three months after it uh, begins the, the pandemic. Then we have to work like that uh, at my hospital that uh, I said it's a uh, uh, big hospital. We have the equipment and with uh, the quality uh, that it's okay. We receive uh, uh, protocols uh, to, uh, to actuation in the OR and with the donning and doffing of the PPE, uh, but we don't have the we don't have new uh, an actualization of that uh, protocols because uh, we we read about the other other countries what they are doing in other countries but uh, we yes but we don't have uh, a, a officially an update of these protocols of the use of PPE and that's what we are asking too to our authorities. Uh, I think that one of the most difficult things it was that uh, we are tired. The people, the personnel, the health personnel is tired, and we have to put to put attention in each patient because every patient can be a COVID positive one, and. Uh, most of the time they are with without symptoms in in or and we have to take care to use the ppe uh, correctly and after eight ten months uh, we have to to continue with this attention thank you we hope that uh, some uh, companies here in el salvador can uh, uh, manufacture the ppa because this is a global problem in the uh, United States, uh, you know, Spain, they have a lot of money to pay for this equipment. And uh, we can make the, the, the same thing because we are a poor, a poor country. Uh, but uh, at the, until January 22, uh, we have 76 doctors died for COVID? No, we have a, a lot of people died for COVID from personal, from health person. And one of the more difficult is that like in a, a lot of countries, that problem of, is of health now is a political. A political problem. Thank you, Susanna. Political, yes. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your candid um, words and for sharing your experience with us. Uh, our final speaker for this segment is uh, Mr. Mohammed Mubarak. Um, go ahead, you have the floor. Thank you, and hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Mubarak Mohammed. I'm a nurse in anesthetist in Edna Ad University Hospital, Hargeisa, Somaliland. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we had we faced a lot of challenges that included a lack of PPE N95, and also my country we also have had global and short, my country has also the shortage of anesthesia providers, and uh, some. Some of the anesthesia providers, even in Somalia, were tested positive on COVID-19 uh, due to the lack of PPE and N95. 
uh, that's what we had the challenge we had and still uh, there was no any manufacturing that can produce the BBE and or other surgical uh, unless like some safety face mask but uh, that's one thing and also last year in September we had an we had an material resources that uh, the developed by Lab Focus Smile Train and WFSA, the uh, pro surgical and safety preventive patient who have suspected or positive for COVID-19, how we can do for preoperatively. Mainly in my hospital, we do a lot of pediatric surgery research and uh, neural tube defects. So we're trying to postpone uh, some searches, but there was another challenge that the condition for the, the children who need really to have the surgery. Um, later, uh, later sometime in May, that's the first time we had a uh, first donation for PPE and N95. And still there was a shortage in the whole country. There was very few hospitals that can access having the BBE, N95, and the other face shield, and all the goggles or plus upon. Even also the solution for the hand rub, such as an alcohol or the other stuff thing is. Um, the, the, so that's the experience we had there during, and, and still we are facing the challenge in and some different type of hospitals. And, and I hope also we, are, we will be providing again or implementation some hospitalists unless uh, they can do the, the preoperative care and for the patient who are suspected or positive and, and unless they are running the lack of PPE and face mask. Uh, that's for the experience I will share in my country, also my hospital. Thank you, Mubarak. Really appreciate yeah, so. your presence and sharing uh, your particular experiences in Somaliland. Our next section uh, we are going to discuss is regarding the decontamination and reuse of PPE. After this uh, quick discussion on PPE decontamination and reuse, we'd love to hear from our audience, um, take some comments, questions from you guys. And so if you have comments or questions that you're thinking of, please feel free to raise your hand in the um, in the Zoom or to put questions in the chat that we can pause and take them. Uh, so for our next section, we wanna hear from Dr. Reshma Ambulkar and please share with us your experience. Uh, have you been decontaminating and reusing PPE during the pandemic? What insights do you have to share with us and what's been helpful in this process? Go ahead, Reshma, you have the floor. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so yes, uh, I work at Tata Memorial Hospital as a perioperative uh, provider. And um, when uh, COVID-19 pandemic did set in, um, there was a shortage of uh, uh, PPEs, including masks. And that was because of, mainly because of the required uh, uh, PPEs and masks were uh, kind of not available, though we were ready to uh, get them. So there was a mismatch of the required to what we were getting as a supply. And that um, uh, opened up that we started searching for options as to how we can get through to this period. And what we did was, the first thing we did was uh, wait and reuse. So uh, we gave each of the health healthcare providers five uh, uh, N95s, which uh, then they would uh, you uh, and five uh, uh, bags, paper bags, so to store them. So each uh, uh, N95 was used for one uh, per week. Again, this was only for. Uh, uh, non-COVID suspected patients, any COVID suspected or COVID positive patients, all uh, healthcare workers were given PPEs and a new N95 to perform the procedures. Again, the COVID ICU, everybody donned and doffed uh, every eight hour duties with uh, a new. So this was for the routine surgeries, which we did not stop uh, owing to our being a, a oncology center. So we had taken it up as a semi-emergent procedures. And the second thing what we use for con uh, decontamination was uh, autoclaving. So uh, we uh, had people uh, with uh, TFR, which I think even uh, Livebox was trying to uh, 
uh, have a uh, this with uh, uh, with uh, Tata Institute of Research Center. So they helped us to come up with this uh, procedure of decontamination, which was. Uh, 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 at autoclaving for uh, 80 degrees centigrade for around 30 minutes uh, to one hour. So that's what they tried. And uh, they found that it did not affect the efficacy of the N95s. So that was again the use. So this was mainly for a couple of months till we got control of the uh, shortage. So once we got the supply, we were back to uh, having uh, N95s being freely given to all the healthcare providers. Uh, the other uh, question is, did we buy PP uh, or N95s? Yes. So during this period, some of the doctors did feel unsafe about using the re used PPEs because they were not very sure. And that time it was the initial phases where people were going through a lot of anxiety and uh, they weren't sure of uh, whether these uh, techniques were really uh, uh, safe. So um, yes, at that period of time, many of the doctors did buy uh, N95s from the market and uh, continue to use new uh, N95s daily. And uh, the uh, other thing is, yes, so uh, I would say 50% would buy and 50% would go on with the hospital policy of reusing it. And um, uh, the other thing, which is, uh, this was again for one, one and a half month after uh, we stopped uh, the uh, contamination. And uh, my suggestion would be that it is best avoided but uh, but it's better than nothing. So I guess if you have the resources, you may as well go in for a new uh, N95 and PPEs. But yes, when you don't have, then all these options are definitely to be looked in and the safest to be used. So I guess the healthcare providers shouldn't uh, work under strenuous conditions. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much, Reshma. Thank you for sharing all those innovations and workarounds that um, you've been using at your facility to manage shortages. Our second speaker uh, for this section is Nati, and we also have our chair back, Dr. Gatuya. So I'm going to be handing it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, for stepping in. Nati, you can proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, for us, um, for our theaters and our work uh, on the COVID unit, we haven't been um, reusing, um, we haven't been reusing uh, the N95s, and, um, but uh, in other sections of the hospitals and also in other hospitals, uh, we also noted that uh, people were having to reuse but mostly uh, the surgical uh, face mask uh, when they are doing their other routine uh, essential health services. And we have observed this when we have gone on field trips. And what we have also noted, like in one particular uh, rural health center, uh, the nurse who was, deliver was the one on duty uh, to do deliveries. She actually had a cloth uh, face mask in one other rural health center. Um, the other, the nurse was on duty, also had the mask that had been washed and ironed, you know, the normal surgical mask that had been washed and ironed uh, a number of times. And the other thing that we also noticed was also uh, the quality of, um, uh, of the PPE at the, at the rural health center level or at the district, health, district hospital uh, level was not as the same as what we would find in the central hospital. So sometimes when, when we condemn certain um, uh, PPEs, I don't know how they will also find their way down uh, somewhere um, where they will be used. And um, the only, the major thing that has been um, reused are actually the reusable like uh, aprons, uh, the gumboots, um, gowns, and the, uh, the cotton gowns, they go for the normal laundry and the plastic uh, aprons, uh, the re reusable plastic aprons. And at times uh, in other hospitals, uh, the non-reusable plastic aprons 
are also cleaned. And, for, and to clean this, uh, they usually use 0.5% uh, sodium hypochlorite uh, solution. But masks that are going to be used in, within, um, within the community, um, when I've talked to my friends, uh, even coming in from the hospital, uh, some of them, they tell me, uh, well, I just aerate it and I can wear it again the following day. And one of them told me, uh, no, I actually just use the hot African sun to try and burn whatever is on it so that I can wear it again. And, and also, um, do I have confidence in this process? Uh, when we are just using, when we are cleaning the reusable uh, materials like plastics and using 0.5% hypochlorite for solution, most of the time I am. However, because of the pandemic and the fact that we have been getting uh, our supplies from different suppliers, that a uh, hypochlorite solution, sometimes you really don't trust it. So what we always want to recommend is whichever suppliers giving us the hypochlorite solution also gives us uh, the safety data, um, um, safety data information as well. And um, the lessons we learned um, during this pandemic really is the rational use of PPEs. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody wanted to be in a Tyvek suit because that was what we saw in China. That is what we saw on TV. That is what we saw when, um, uh, when we had all those numerous um, webinars with the Chinese. But as time went on, and as people got more confident and as more training was availed, um, people now uh, were able to use uh, PPE rationally. I think that has also uh, helped um, in uh, protecting the, um, the PPEs. And the other thing that we've seen is- uh, Naughty, I have to cut you short. They have to cut me short? Ah, yes. Okay. All right. Yes. So, um, We'll come back to you with the questions. Oh. Nicole, kindly uh, proceed from there. Sure. Um, thank you for everyone who shared your experiences so far. I think from our perspective, uh, you know, as someone who's currently working in a high income country and has been engaging with uh, some groups that are focused on the evidence base for PPE uh, decontamination and reuse, like N95 Decon, um, we've seen just you know a lot of sort of information asymmetry and confusion out there for what methods are safe for certain types of PPE and not others, um, and that goes sort of in the conservative and liberal directions. So, for example, you know as Nati mentioned and as Reshma mentioned, there <clears throat> are PPE items like gowns scrub caps, boots that might be easily washed with soap and water, laundered, and that would be safe uh, and acceptable for reuse and would even save on waste. Um, there are a lot of places that do a better job than high income countries on uh, sort of preserving all of the PPE waste that we're generating. But then on the other hand, when it comes especially to respiratory PPE, there are a number of methods that are unsafe and so some of the things that Nati was observing, you know, waiting one day or placing it in the sun um, or, you know, maybe using the same mask over and over for a long time, uh, multiple, multiple uses, those would be unsafe methods. Um, but I fear the community internationally doesn't have clarity of information or the specifics um, of what methods are acceptable and unacceptable uh, for particularly surgical mask and N95 reuse. So that's something I hope as a response community, we can do a bit better of a job on is just making the specifics of those methods very clear and very actionable for staff who need to use one of those methods. Back to you, Zippy. Thank you, Nicole. I'd just like to ask from the audience if there's anybody with comments or maybe the panelists, we open this for discussion for the next like nine minutes. And we want to find out what people's rationale use of PPEs was. 
I have one question that has been asked on, uh, on email and it says, uh, what does the panel feel about uh, reusing N95? And I think you've addressed part of that, but there's somebody on the audience who thinks that because of expenses that they have been reusing and they just want like a confirmation whether this is a correct practice or not. And then uh, how many times can it be reused? So I'll ask the panel first and then the audience, if you have something to say, please unmute yourself and speak. Let's keep our talks short so that we have more people participating. Sidby, I'm happy to take that one. Uh, just in terms of the evidence base for the wait and reuse method, which is what we've been calling it. Um, there's some literature out there to suggest that a five to seven day waiting period at about room temperature is sufficient to reduce the uh, viral infectious particles of SARS-CoV-2 so that a mask could be more or less safely reused. Um, so if you're using that five day waiting period of either a surgical mask or an N95, and it's in a breathable container set aside, not touching it for five days, then you should be able to reuse that mask after five days of waiting. And when it comes to N95s, they tend to get deformed with repeated donning and doffing cycles. So if you're going to use this method, you have to be using a seal check every time you put it on, make sure the mask still seals to your face and probably don't use it more than five times because after that it won't fit you very well and it won't protect, protect as well. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Saleh has raised her hand. Uh, do you want to ask or say something, Elizabeth? Yeah, I was the person who asked the question about how often you could reuse the 95, N95, and that's been well answered. Thank you, Nicole. Um, and also about the safety of it. And what I would um, want to ask now is, where you've had experience in, especially in these rural units, where there's no option except to keep reusing, reusing, and um, also this this um, experience of 50% of the anaesthetists being able to buy their own N95 and 50% having to do it the other way. Did you see any difference in the rate of infection of these health workers? in those who had the ability to buy their own masks compared to those who had to keep reusing masks and reusing other forms of PPE? Or do you not have the answer to that yet? Like what, what a, a broad question, like did you see more COVID in your health workers in the rural areas compared to your health workers in the cities? I think Nicole or Reshmi can answer that because they were on the study. Reshma, I'd love to hear your comments just on the reuse practices. Um, in terms of the study methods, we didn't measure any um, actual COVID positivity rates among healthcare workers. So from our study, unfortunately, we can't comment on that. But Reshma, please go ahead. Hello. We can hear you. Okay. Yeah, we didn't measure the COVID. Uh, uh, yeah, positivity. But I guess with uh, Tata Institute, uh, when they had uh, tested, they found that over ninety percent uh, was um, the efficacy was maintained. So that's what uh, I think. Even Mansi had. Uh, um, she was trying to get uh, uh, the TFR, the data on how they were autoclaving and uh, the efficacy of the N95s. But uh, even at our hospital, the rest of the PPs and all were never used. So we did only for the N95s a small pilot study, and then they had put it to use. So that's how it was. 
But even then, the healthcare providers had their reservations, to be very honest, because that was at the initial time when the supply-demand ratio was not was completely mismatched, and there was a lot of anxiety around uh, uh, the healthcare providers. Does that answer the question, or? Uh, Faye Evans had her hand up. Faye, you want to speak? There's something. I, I don't see her anymore. Uh, maybe Nina, you can comment on that issue. Yes, thank you. I think Krishna is, is right on what she just said. When it comes to the, the COVID the measuring patients who actually were in the city and those in the rural areas, whether we were able to, to comment to know whether they were infected with COVID or not using the, the research of it. We didn't do that because we didn't do a qualitative uh, research on, on that to be able to know whether those who use the PPEs, the N95 or not, had to had less infection or not. So that's that's done. But for the decontamination, I think my colleagues have already been talking about that and I will not comment on that anymore because that's exactly what you're supposed to do. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the audience? I think we lost Faye. She had wanted to say something, but anybody else with a comment? Um, my one comment is uh, on whether rural uh, healthcare workers compared to uh, city uh, healthcare workers are infected more. Um, I think up to now in our country, we have, I think, about 1,300 um, uh, healthcare workers that have been infected. But when we look at the statistics, when you break them down by province, we realize that our hotspots, which are the um, the metropolitan provinces, Arare and Ulawayo, have the greatest number of healthcare workers uh, that are infected. And when we also look at um, in the general population as well, those are the two cities that also, the, the, uh, the two provinces that also have the highest uh, number of infections anyway. Thank you. Another question that has been asked, and maybe I'll uh, ask somebody who is actively out doing the work to answer, is uh, what systems have worked for those distributing, maintaining, and regulating the use of PPE? Uh, so, because the person says that with issues with fear of the pandemic driving employees to be non-compliant with the amount being used, that's running out of PPE supply quickly. Maybe Rashma or Noti? I didn't hear, I didn't get the question. If you can oh, come Susanna, again. You, Someone is asking what systems have worked for those distributing, maintaining and regulating the use of PPE. They have uh, had issues with fear of pandemic driving employees to be non-compliant with the amount being used, that's running out of PPE supply quickly. I bet coding of PPEs. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, one of the things actually that has been happening has been at local level, at local station institution. Uh, some institutions um, ring fence um, uh, the supplies for theater and the supplies uh, for the uh, COVID wards. And when they do that, it means um, the other wards then have to ration whatever little that they have. And even within that COVID unit or within the theaters, you find that as I said, indicated earlier on, we don't have um, that luxury anymore, whereby they are just on the desk there when you, as you get into theater and you pick up your stuff and go in. But now somebody has to hand them in. I guess they have to hand them out to you. So that's, uh, that, that's some of the rationing that is happening at a uh, station and also at departmental level. Uh, those are some of the things that uh, have been happening. And also just the training on rational use so that you know uh, if I'm working in, a, in um, 
in this particular area of the hospital, uh, this is the level of PP that I need, as opposed to somebody who is working, say, in the ICU with COVID patients or somebody who's working in theater with COVID patients. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we have to move on to the next session because we have, have quite a lot to cover. So we are going to do training and protocols. So we are going to be told about how the trainings have been happening, what protocols have been introduced and how that has worked. Take us through this. We'll have three speakers. Each will have three minutes. Uh, we'll start with uh, Nina Kapochichi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zipora. Uh, my name is Nina Kapochichi, and I'm a smart dream program manager in West Africa from Kokon uh, Zone. And uh, on this question, I would like to give it a bit of context. So in the midst of the crisis, as a representative in the international NGO, one of the response that we had to do was to provide PPEs and postpone our surgical, our surgeries, so that our uh, health personnel can actually focus on responding to the COVID in their respective hospitals. So based on that, as they were being provided with the essential PPEs, one of the protocols or updated or our protocols that we, we provided for them would be the donning and dolphin which was the primary first one that we, we provided for them as resources distributed to all partners. And then after we had to go on to the PPEs, how to, uh, Dr. Nutty has talked a lot about it, the rationing and the conservation of PPEs, the N95, we talked about it, the sterilization and the reuse of it. So all these resources were sent to our partners to be armed so that they can respond to the, the COVID-19. And aside from that, the pulse asymmetry was also a necessary tool that we provided also for the partners. But to be able to use it during COVID-19 was another, another aspect to consider. So with the, uh, the tool provided by Lifebox, there was a Lifebox tool for identifying COVID-19 to who will be COVID-19 patient who really need oxygen too. So alongside the two, the materials, the process metric that was given, we're given also those tools to be used and to know how to use during COVID-19. Not uh, putting aside the important in the center of one of our uh, articles that we published like last year, which is the COVID-19 prepared, COVID preparedness uh, in sub-Saharan uh, sub uh, Africa for surgery and obstetric and anesthesia. We, also, we were able to give the check, provide them with a COVID-19 checklist. Uh, patient checklist uh, checklist for the for our partners and that came with the training as well and it was a tool that was important because it was really based on on the team behavior or team communication it's not based on any tool any ppe this was really based on people coming together to be able to use this checklist to protect themselves and the patient aside from that other trainees did follow but we also really advise our partners to be able to align themselves in, with the government uh, uh, protocols that have been put aside for the ORs in their respective countries. But when I talk about the training, we also have to really, really take a look at the consistency of the use of the PPEs in every country. So one of the solutions that we had to really think about when it comes to even after the training is that how do we continue to help our partners to get access to the PPEs? So one of the solutions that came from this, uh, from Smart Train is to allow uh, our partners or as a program manager to find local vendors on ground to be able to help with the essential PPEs that our patients, our partners needed so that they'll be able to properly use those tools that we have provided from uh, provided for them for the training or updated OR protocols so they can they can use it. Uh, when Thank it comes to yes. I have to cut you short, you'll come back during the discussion. Okay. Uh, we'll have Mubarak give us his thoughts and then we shall Hello, uh, my name is Mubarak. I am from Somalia and I'm a nurse and anesthetist. So uh, during the COVID time, uh, but the protocol, the training and an ability that we had was uh, we had a clinical uh, management for COVID-19 patient with an international organization called MSF. 
and that's one thing. The second thing uh, we had was the uh, a surgical safety checklist for suspected or positive patient with a live box and a smile train. And also we distribute an almost in 18 facilities for pulse oximeter live boxes and we train them some of the staff is how to use them. The pulse oximeter, there was an, a shortage of and uh, having those uh, pulse oximeters and the pulse oximeter is one of the crucial of the diagnosing or um, using for the patient. Uh, for those who are positive or no for the COVID-19. And that's uh, what I will share. I think the time is fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susanna, you can take us through. You okay, hello again. In El Salvador, the first protocol that we uh, made, it was to cancel the elective surgery because we need uh, all our uh, work for the patient with uh, COVID and we need to protect our, our patients. And uh, we uh, start working, as I said uh, at the beginning, we received training uh, for the use of uh, PPE, donning and doffing, we practice a lot. Uh, but the, again, the, the experience, it was different uh, from one to other hospital. Uh, in, uh, it depends on the people who are working there. Uh, for example, we, we have to, to uh, get some PPA to practice. And we made a, a lot of practice for one or two weeks. And we really feel comfortable with the, with the equipment. But that, uh, don't happen in the other hospitals. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, we have to uh, begin again with the um, August or September. We have to work again with the um, elective surgeries because the, the patients were waiting. And we have a, a lot of cases that uh, they uh, get uh, worse because they need the, the, the surgery. And uh, we work with the protocol uh, of uh, working at OR with uh, patient with COVID. We work with other colleagues uh, at the health ministry. And uh, uh, after that, with the elective surgery, we have to work in uh, uh, protocols uh, for the, the uh, taste, uh, the exams to the patient for elective surgery. And uh, we found that uh, uh, approximately 40% uh, of the kids in, the, the, uh, in my hospital, we, we have only, only children, it, uh, maybe 35 or 40% of the, of the kids of the children have positive to COVID and they are asymptomatic that uh, alert to us. We have to be very, very careful because uh, they can uh, contaminate the rest of the of the people of the of the health surgery. But uh, we have to work with that every day, and we are trying, uh, like I said before, to get update in the uh, protocols of use the PPA, because uh, now uh, our infectologists, for example, they said that uh, uh, the surgeon that who is uh, make the surgery uh, don't need doesn't need the PPE uh, level three, but the people who are at the uh, airway, like anesthesiologists or technicians, uh, we need the most quality uh, kind of uh, PPE. And we are working on that. Uh, the pandemic, it has uh, a lot of impact because uh, uh, everything is stopped. And as I, I said, uh, a lot of patients uh, have a complication from his uh, uh, illness and they need attention. And most of the people are busy with uh, the, the cases of COVID and can, uh, can't uh, give this, this attention. Uh, we are thank trying you, to get... Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, sorry, I have to cut people short because we have a lot to get through. Uh, I would like to ask the other speakers if anybody has something to say about the training and protocols and improving safety. 
then we shall open it to the audience. Yeah, Dr. Sipura, I'd like to just uh, comment on the impact uh, of the training. And uh, one thing we have observed is that there has been po both positive and negative. Positive in the sense that um, most of our partners felt really, really confident to have a tool and to know how to respond appropriately in different circumstances, whether in the surgery itself, anesthesia, or as a team. Uh, there was a decrease of the fear of transmission. And there's, there's fear and then there's transmission. So there was a decrease a bit for those who implemented those, uh, those tools, there was a decrease in the fear and they felt more confident in working in the environment despite the danger in which their own lives was. Uh, and finally, decrease in transmission, although we were not able to quantify that in, in, a, in a scientific way. But then the negative part that I would like to under, uh, underline, which is really true for every partner here uh, and every personnel, was they were, they were flooded with so much information, flooded with so much protocols to use that they, they didn't know what are the essential protocols to use at the right time or essential training to use at the right time. And that was a big lesson for us because in the report itself, we were able to see that there was about 56% or 59% who, received training in protocols for COVID-19 response. But later on, when you see how many of them implemented it, 56% did not implement it. So there were a lot of training, but where was the implementation? And why was it like that? It was because there were too many information. So any takeaway from this is that any resources given to our partners should be very specific on what is needed, more specific trainings, not just flooding with a lot of resources, information, but more specific training should be given and more specific protocols and specific training uh, materials should be given to our partners. So these are some of the few lessons we as, as organizations or uh, stakeholders and collaborators learn from, from this uh, experience as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chichi. Uh, anybody else? Any of the other speakers or? Can I? Naughty. Yes. Um, in, uh, uh, in Zimbabwe, um, the division of anesthesia and critical care in Harare, uh, that comprise of University of Zimbabwe uh, consultants and uh, government consultants at both Harare Hospital, which is Sandim Gabe Hospital and Parirenyatko Hospital, they got together and Together, they developed uh, protocols, uh, they developed uh, guidelines on what needs to be done. And most of it, because they were having to read, and at that particular time, when, they, when, uh, when all this was started, we still hadn't had any cases. And, when, and if we had had cases, there were still very few, and, there was, uh, and the workload then was still uh, very low. So what they were doing, most of it was really uh, practicing, uh, panel beating, changing this and changing that. And through that, they then developed a curriculum, which they then cascaded down to train all the other surgeons, uh, the anesthetists, uh, theater nurses, and everyone else. And, and uh, later on, uh, this training was then cascaded uh, down to the um, provincial hospitals. And um, unfortunately, we then were hit a, a, a very huge... Uh, second wave and we could not continue with the cascading, but that is also going to, uh, to happen as well. And with that, uh, every other cadre, it had basic training in, uh, in IPC and uh, case management as well. Thank you. Thank you, Noti. Uh, the audience, if anybody has a question, please unmute yourself and speak. Uh, I also want to inform you that some of the questions that you're putting on the chat are being answered by the speakers. But if you still want to ask uh, in person, please unmute yourself and speak. Susanna, did you want to add some comments? You're muted. Susanna, you're muted. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, I see. Uh, okay, it's okay. About uh, 
about Nina, uh, what said about the a lot of information that it was really really difficult because the the it it was a lot of information and we can't process that uh, pro information at the same time and we have to to know what it was uh, good and what it was uh, wrong and what it was really really uh, correct and that is what's very difficult but i think that that we have to to get the good thing of that uh, that's what we are doing now this this webinar this this panel it's uh, part of that because before before the pandemic we could say no this is not not possible we uh, we have to go to africa or to asia or i don't know to other country to make this this meeting but now after the pandemic, we know that we can change, share the information and we can be near uh, while we are really very, very far. And uh, uh, that uh, was a very, very good thing because uh, we can, uh, for the first time, I think, that we could read an uh, article or some information in one very important uh, journal uh, when uh, maybe they uh, uh, put it uh, two weeks or two days before and we can read it uh, very fast and, and that it was amazing i think thank you very much does anybody in the audience have a final comment before we move on Okay, so we are going to move on to safety. And this pandemic has been evolving. And where we were, where we were at the beginning is definitely not where we are. So we want our speakers for the next session to tell us how safe do you feel now offering uh, surgical services? And how does that compare to how you felt? at the beginning of the pandemic. So I'll ask uh, Dr. Shipamba Noti to go first and tell us what she feels about safety. Oh, thank you, ZP. Uh, yes, um, at the beginning, I think we are all uh, full of fear. And I remember, like I, I, as I mentioned earlier on, it was members of the division who, were, uh, who developed the, uh, the training curriculum and everything after reading through what other people had gone through. And um, I remember bumping into one of, the, uh, uh, one of the trainers and he was looking dejected and he was like, I don't think I can do this. Uh, but right now, he is one of our champions. He is there in the forefront. He is there uh, leading other physicians and also encouraging other physicians. I think at a personal level myself, I think I've moved from fear and trepidation to being confident um, in carrying out uh, my duties. And part of it is also because of uh, the training and also reading around as much as I can and also trying to stay away from some of that uh, Some of it's very difficult, um, then um, uh, it becomes easier when you have a much a stronger uh, uh, mental fortitude. And I'm, well, I'm, I'm always afraid that I might get infected, my relative might get infected, or my coworker is going to get infected. Uh, so that is always at the back of your mind as you do whatever you do. So you, every time you're, you're, you're in theater, uh, you're always asking yourself, am I safe? Am I doing something that is safe? Is my coworker doing something that is safe? If I see somebody who's doing something that is unsafe, I try as much as possible to see if I can correct. And if somebody has uh, some myths and fears, I also try as much as possible to see if I can, uh, I can correct. And because uh, now people were able to, we're now uh, more confident, you find that the amount of work that, we, that was being done in theaters actually went up. 
I remember looking at a graph on, on one of the, um, in one of the theaters. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic in March, it swooshed down. The numbers literally just fell from, uh, from whatever level they were. But by June, those numbers had started creeping up to such an extent that we'd actually surpassed the numbers that we were actually doing uh, in, uh, in January. And I think I attribute that to uh, the training on people how to use PPE safely, a rational use of PPE, and also adequate and sufficient supplies of PPE, particularly uh, for theater use. Um, and also working hand in glove with the IPC focal persons in each hospital, we find that that is very, very uh, useful. And they become, um, they've actually become our close, some of our closest uh, work allies. Um, and to try to, use, as much as possible, to try and use, um, not to reuse um, uh, PPE, particularly uh, when you are uh, in patient, um, patient surroundings. And for this, I think we need deep pockets, but deep pockets are not, are not easy to come back. Uh, as a result, I think we are getting quite a lot of support uh, from, our, um, from our partners, particularly uh, those from the UN family and any other partners that we have uh, around us. Sorry, I have to cut you short. Ah, uh, I was done. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Reshma, uh, maybe you can give us your experience about uh, safety, how you feel now compared to how you felt at the beginning of the pandemic, what you think has changed, and just how safe you feel. Thank you. Um, so at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, providing medical care was with, started with a lot of uh, uncertainty and anxiety. But as uh, things progressed and we were made more aware by regular updates by our hospital administration and uh, the e efforts they were taking to make us feel safe, uh, that is by easy availability of uh, PP arranging for our transport, uh, getting uh, all elective patients tested for COVID and uh, ha having uh, quarantine facilities for both the uh, staffs as well as their relatives. So I guess that um, made us more at ease at work, that we were well taken care of and that kind of helped to working at the hospital. Um, I guess now it's much, uh, uh, much easier and uh, we feel it's a new normal that's how I feel in fact um, it, it just doesn't feel any different now I've kind of got used to working with the N95 whereas previously even wearing a three ply was difficult so I guess um, it's it's been a, a steady and a continuous transformation but uh, a lot of um, the efforts were taken by the hospital to make us feel safe by regular updates using social medias and uh, also having a lot of training in our hospital. So that did help us. And uh, I think that's the general uh, perception of most uh, healthcare workers at my hospital. Uh, what I would say made the biggest difference was easy availability of PPEs, which kind of eased after the uh, initial shortage. Uh, and, um, and again, one more thing, which now we are all looking forward, 80% of the healthcare workers at a hospital has have got their first dose of vaccination. So we feel uh, we are now due for the second vaccination dose. And then we feel we'll be more uh, safe. Uh, one thing which uh, we definitely fear, I think most of us is getting infected at the hospital, being a car uh, carrier and uh, infecting our loved ones. So that's something, some fear we all uh, uh, had to the extent that many of us who had elderly family at home or uh, uh, family with uh, family members with uh, multiple comorbidities, we were opting to stay in hostels or uh, facilities which were made available by hospitals. So that was a difficult part, not seeing your loved ones and at work, working under stressful condition. But things have kind of changed now. So um, 
things are getting back to normal in India. So that has helped. Uh, recommendations, I would say, is uh, uh, we shouldn't let our guard down. Uh, that is very, very important because I think we are uh, far from being out of the woods with multiple strains we hear. Uh, the Ken strain and the South African strain. So we, uh, I guess uh, that is very important to continue to update ourselves with the current knowledge. And uh, obviously it, uh, when it all started in January last year, it was uh, new for all of us and we were learning. Maybe we are a bit more learned now with uh, more evidence which is available. And uh, I think uh, we should use whatever is available. Uh, especially Rashma, I okay. have to cut you yeah. short. Okay, thank you. You can just finish your statement then. Yeah, yeah so I guess we uh, hopefully would get more learned and uh, 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 work with the current change uh, uh, situation and uh, help to serve our uh, patients better. All of us should take care, good care, all the healthcare workers of ourselves. And uh, you should always remember that we have to take care of ourselves, then only we can take care of our patients well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Reshma. Um, sorry, we have to keep everybody on their toes so we can hear as many people and also have a discussion with the audience. And now we are going to let Mubarak tell, tell us how he feels about safety, how he feels now compared to when the pandemic uh, started, and yeah, what you're doing to increase that feeling of safety at work. Uh, hello, uh, so yeah, and when the Mubarak. pandemic is, yeah, hello, do you hear me? So when the pandemic um, starting and um, we, everyone has a fear, so everyone from us, so the worst thing is this, uh, we don't have any, 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 any training that we had about the patients, how you can uh, do an in, in infection, pre-infection, such as this and, and kind of affairs. And, and also about even doing for resuscitation, and the, there was a shortage of, as, as I mentioned earlier, there was a shortage of anesthesia providers in Somaliland. And then I was thinking about in my, my facility, other facilities, and then other sub-district hospitals and reaching it for those who need it, how, the, how these things will be in solved. And so, yeah, that's how I feel. But after I had um, an attending several and online webinars, uh, such as infection perfection and other physical training, clinical management for the COVID-19 ba COVID patient, and the last one was the surgical and safety checklist uh, with the patient or suspected. Uh, that makes me um, a lot of um, confident that I can be proceed and help it there for those who really need it for my health. And um, after we had uh, the training of ORD, co ORD contamination, minimizing patient transmission. And also there was another part that uh, teach us for the leadership in intervention for the uh, non ethical aspect for surgical performance. And um, yeah, so now I'm feeling uh, confident, but it's still, uh, yeah, there was a day and common things are common, but um, I'm feeling uh, very safe. Actually, not very safe, but I feel safe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mubarak. And I'm sure all of us in the audience have had a transition from how we felt in terms of safety at work from when the pandemic started to where we are now, even to the point where, as Reshma says, we have vaccination. So we just want a few of us to have that discussion about how you feel about safety uh, from the time the pandemic started up to now. Uh, the floor is open. Just unmute yourself and speak. Nicole, you want to say something? I'd like to hear, if possible, from our other panelists rather than myself. I um, feel like I've been very fortunate to have access to PPE and vaccines in my setting. So maybe Nina or Susanna could make their comments too. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Well, safety from the point of view of an organization, it wasn't easy for us as an organization as well. 
because we may not be clinically involved directly on the field, but we're always behind our partners and our professionals on ground. So I think the first thing we had to do was redefine safety. We need to understand that surgery itself needed, to, was supposed to be safe. I mean, surgery at the onset, we have to we always make effort as an organization with co in collaboration with other organizations right here to always provide all those training and protocols even way before COVID-19 came in the picture. So with the arrival of COVID-19, I think it's reinforced the basic concept of safety that we should be applying every day and not waiting for if uh, it's, it's, well, I'll call it a viral, a viral tsunami on us like this. So we were, it gave us a, a, an attitude to be able to redefine safety and to really reinforce the basic uh, attitude towards safety or protocols to use in the OR. We are doing the same thing, we're just reinforcing it. We didn't change anything here in our discussion. We're just reinforcing what we're supposed to do a long time ago, every day in a consistent manner. So as an organization, we think for our partners that we will support them even more to do those basic, uh, have those basic attitudes that we have been talking about, that we have been discussing. That's why Smart Train offers a lot of trainings in terms of safety, anesthesia, safety uh, 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 trainings that we have. And we have many other trainings that are really in the direction of safety all along before COVID set in, set in. So reinforcing that is one of our strongest attitudes right now to help our partners. That's one. Two is, Reshma said, said it, it's a new normal. Right? We have to get used to it and find the appropriate ways to be able to uh, continue in that manner and keep up with the response. So is it better than before? I would say that we can feel even when we see our partners or we discuss with them, they are much more at peace. At the beginning, I have phone calls. What are we going to do? How am I going to survive? How do we do this? And with the medical advisor board from Smile Train, we were able to come up with some guidelines, very basic guidelines to support our, our partners to be able to feel to be calm, not only that because they need our, their mental health was endangered at that moment as well. So we need to support right. them. So safety for them today, I feel is much better. Uh, they know what to do, they feel prepared, they have the tools and they know how to reach to us whenever we are, we are available. And we have learned to thank, listen. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Nina. Thank Sorry, you. I have to cut you a bit short. Okay. Uh, Susanna, do you want to make a comment about uh, the, the feeling of safety? Yes, thank you. Uh, like uh, everyone, I think that we, many of us were in, in panic at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, but uh, uh, we have been working, then now we feel really, really more safe. We have, uh, uh, we know how to, to use the, the PPE and uh, we feel more, more safe, uh, but uh, we are, uh, we know that uh, it, that won't finish. <laughs> Maybe in one or two years, we could uh, uh, back to the normally or maybe a new normally. Uh, now uh, we are working with uh, almost the same patient that we have uh, before in the pandemic with the elective surgery and the people are more comfortable with this uh, situation. Uh, but the psychological thing, it's, uh, it's very, very important because uh, uh, many of uh, the colleagues and the uh, uh, health workers uh, I had lost uh, some uh, uh, familiar and they, they have to face that and to continue working. Uh, someone was uh, asking, uh, what about the patient? How the, the patient feel in OR? And I think that the patient have, uh, uh, it's very afraid. In our case, the, the father and the mother of the children uh, have, uh, um, Doubts about uh, bring his his children because they know that here at the hospital they could be uh, contaminated from COVID, 
then uh, many of them don't want to come to the hospital and we have to uh, let them to, to say that and to give them a uh, safe, to make them uh, feel safe because we have to uh, use every the, the protocols and uh, what we have to uh, be sure that they won't contaminate from COVID because it's our responsibility. The patient can contaminate us and we can contaminate the, the, the patient. And it's very, very, very important that we be responsible with that. As, as a last question, somebody is asking, is there always a need to have a negative pressure and have a filter in non-COVID OT? I know uh, from where we speak, those negative pressure rooms are uh, something that we don't come across so oftenly. Uh, so maybe somebody from uh, another function can tell us, what, what, what do you think about that? In terms of your feeling of safety, do you think it improves? Uh, should we be worried, those of us who work in places without negative pressure rooms? Or how, what do you think? Anybody can answer. Uh, hi. Um, Nati. We, uh, as I said, our, um, our host, we have two major hospitals that are about uh, 10 kilometers apart. And on one of the hospitals, that's where it was designated to be a COVID center. And one of the theaters was then um, fitted with negative pressure. But over time, that negative pressure also does not work or it needs to be fixed and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, I think as people, we, as we have gotten um, a bit more confident, um, we have also started working at the other hospital uh, in, in areas where there is no negative pressure. But however, being an old hospital, um, some of the theaters are very poorly ventilated and there's always that risk at the back of everyone's mind. Because I think we had a mini outbreak in, uh, uh, in one set of staff, in about two sets of staffs that worked uh, in two different theaters. So that is always at the back of our minds, uh, such that uh, when um, at that particular hospital, there is a patient who needs a cesarean section, uh, really it becomes a big, huge process of trying to get uh, that patient done. And if it is a patient um, who can be done semi-electively for other reasons, and the other hospital is not busy, then the patient is actually uh, directed to go to that other hospital. But right now we are making do with what we have and uh, keeping our fingers crossed. And as I said, at the outset of the outbreak, we had two uh, mini outbreaks uh, in two of the theater suites. So that is still, um, that still rankles a bit at the back of our minds. And also just cleaning after the theaters has also caused quite a bit of um, consternation as well, because when the cleaning has been done, uh, you find that we need to wait for a while before we go in with the next patient. And this is the particular theater that we are also using for cesarean sections. And then it becomes difficult, particularly if you are now faced with a patient who needs an emergency cesarean section. Thank you. Okay, Sunday Ajike has uh, their heart up. Do you want to say something? Yes, thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm a Max Lovisha surgeon from Nigeria, and I work in the northern part of the country. And uh, during this pandemic, we've had a lot of challenges. Um, talking about safety, um, we, are, we, we the surgeons are, we are seriously concerned about safety of ourselves. And um, in fact, we closed most, we closed. Uh, operations. We were not doing surgical cases, elective cases. We were only attending to minor uh, trauma cases, basically, and those were basically soft tissue uh, uh, surgeries. 
we were not doing we were not doing any instrumentation that would give uh, that would generate aerosol and uh, i'll give you one instance uh, last two weeks we were supposed to go and operate a patient with maxillofacial tumor and i kept on insisting that we should screen this patient we should screen this patient and when we went to screen this patient lo and behold this patient was uh, positive so if we had not been so conscious of it, we would have actually showered everybody with the spray we were going to use because we were going to use a saw to cut the bones and all those things. For those of us generating aerosol, I, I think that this is not the time for us to use our power drills. So if we have to cut bones, we have to be very careful. Either we use the, we use the Archimedean drill, which is less, uh, we, we generate aerosol less, and then we protect ourselves. Most of the time around here, the PPEs are not, are not readily available for surgical procedures. So, and there was a time in our place that uh, most of the people in the, in, in the theater, the theater had to be shut down completely. The theater of the hospital was shut down for about a week or so, because uh, most of the cases there were, the, the, the patient tested positive for COVID. And so everybody had to go on isolation and some people were tested and everything before we could, we could resume uh, work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have to cut this very interesting discussion down. Uh, just Angela and Wright wanted to find out how many people have access to vaccination. And we've suggested that you write a plus one on the chat. Uh, if you go to the chat box and just write plus one, then we'll be able to count how many, and then we can get that to Angela and we'll also distribute it to us. And um, definitely a lot of us do not have access to the vaccine, but we have to still keep working and keep staying safe. Thank you very much to the speakers for sharing their brilliant uh, experiences insights and for you all for joining this webinar because we wouldn't have done much without uh, the audience. Uh, just a note that the video recordings of this will be available and they will be on the Lifebox website in English, in French and in Spanish. And we'll also be emailed to all the people who registered. 